honor their courageous leaders, past, pre present, and future. We rend homage au peuple algonquin, gardien traditionnel de cette terre. Nous reconnaissons les liens sacrés de longue date, l'unissant à ce territoire qui demeure non cédé. Nous rendons également hommage à toutes les personnes autochtones qui habitent Ottawa, qu'elles soient de la région ou d'ailleurs au Canada. Nous reconnaissons les gardiennes et gardiens de savoir traditionnel de tous âges. Nous honorons aussi leurs dirigeantes et dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain, au courage indéniable. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Dr. Sena will introduce Dr. West and Dr. Lashley. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Let me introduce Dr. West and Dr. Lashley. Dr. Colonel West is the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Chair at Union Theological Theology Seminary. Uh, Dr. West teaches on the works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as well as courses of philosophy of religion, African-American critical thought, and a wide range of subjects, including the classics, philosophy, politics, cultural theory, literature, and music. Dr. West is the former professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and professor emeritus at Princeton University. He has written 20 books and has edited 13. He, he is best known for his classics, Race Matters Democra and Democracy Matters. And for his memoir, Brother West, Li Living and Loving Out Loud. His most recent book, Black Prophetic Fire, offers an unflinching look at 19th and 20th century African-American leaders and their visionary legacies. Dr. West has a, a, a passion to communicate to a vast variety of police in order to keep alive the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., a, a legacy of telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice. Thank you, Dr. West, and welcome virtually to Canada. Thank you. How blessed I am and how joyful it is to be in conversation with my dear sister, Dr. Myrna as well, but I salute you, my dear brother, Dr. Jude, as well as my dear sister, Dean Victoria. Canada is still a very, very uh, special place in a lot of ways. We're not just talking about truckers and other protesters and dissident voices, but Canada has a rich history of trying to tell the truth, no matter what vehicle they drive, no matter what color they are no matter what sexual orientation and gender there are. And that's what we talk about today, trying to engage in our quest for truth, for beauty, for goodness. And I'm a revolutionary Christian, so I'm holding on to a quest for the holy. But it's going to cut radically against the grain, and we want to unsettle all of us. And that's precisely, I think, what the great legacy of, uh, of Canada, University of Ottawa, with its 2,000 African students, unprecedented unprecedented. So it's a beautiful thing for me to be here. Thank you, Dr. West. Dr. Mina Lashley is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University, as well as a researcher at the Culture and Mental Health Research Unit at the Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research. Dr. Lashley has worked both as a consultant to First Nations and the Jewish communities, among others. She has the director that she was the director of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and the chair of the Cross-Cultural Roundtable on Security, as well as the vice chair of the board of the National School of Police of Quebec. She has authored tra training manuals on intercultural issues in the workplace and has received several awards, including the 2006 Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Award for Holocaust Studies, the 2004 uh, Martin Luther King Legacy Award, as well as the 1995 Merit Award for Kanawake Native uh, uh, Survival School. She's currently on the Rory Council of Barbados in Montreal. Welcome, my dear Mina Lashley. Thank you so much, Dr. Sina. And allow me for one second to call you Jude, because you are my friend also. You're not just my <laughs> academic colleague. 
It is a thrill to be here. Um, you have invited me before and it was marvelous and I am overwhelmed that you've asked me to return. My dear brother Cornell, thank you very much. It's so nice to meet you in person. It's nice. I mean, I've read you. Who hasn't read you? So, so now we get to converse with each other. And I know that we have the same goal. We're looking for truth. And this is the, the formation that this conversation will take. And I'm anxious to get going with you. Welcome to Canada. Welcome to Canada. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear sister. Let me explain how this panel will work. I will ask an initial question, uh, and then I will let Dr. West and Dr. Lashley debate with each other for one hour. I will come in and ask questions from the audience after. Uh, you can write your questions uh, in the Q&A box as Dr. West and Dr. Lashley discuss. Uh, Dr. West, I recently reread your article when I left Harvard for Princeton. And recent events have shown how you never miss an opportunity to assert the importance of academic freedom. At, at the same time, your work makes you a champion of anti-racism. Dr. Lashley, you never miss an opportunity to assert the importance of academic freedom, anti-racism in academia, and to link academic freedom to academic responsibility, and see both as two sides of the same coin, and that it is impossible to move forward with one without the other. At a time when academic freedom and anti-racism are continu continually pitted against each other in, Canadians, in Canadian universities, I would like to know how both of you, in your professional and personal work and struggles, you manage to reconcile academic freedom and, and anti-racism. Dr. West, we would like to hear you first. Oh, I was going to have my dear sister go first. We won't no, I want anything. you to go first. So I can <laughs> Intellect, beauty, and elegance ought to go before a brother like me, but all right, I'll jump right on in. But for me, you know, my dear brother, I always begin with a note of my relation to those who came before. You see, I'm just a small moment in a great tradition of a grand people, of a black people who've been hated for 400 years and keep trying to dish out love warriors, who've been terrorized but keep dishing out freedom fighters, who've been traumatized but keep dishing out wounded healers and joy spreaders. So my fundamental aim is to lift every voice, which is the anthem of black people in the United States. And by lifting every voice, you cannot but be not just a defender, but an exemplar of academic freedom, but I don't start with academic freedom. I've got it situated within the tradition from whence I come and the people who loved and through blood, sweat and tears were able to shape and mold me and then not confine it to just the American empire. You see, I, 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 I try to be an international person and understand the relation between the American empire and Canada and Mexico and the Chinese empire and the limping Russian empire in its own various ways so that we try to have a historical backdrop that allows us to situate ourselves in light of our vocations and our callings, not just our professions and our careers. Because the universe itself is, the university itself is a site for the formation of professional managers that has its own blindnesses that has its own limitations as well as its own virtues. And so you have to be honest, candid, trying to be courageous, and then just be faithful unto death before the worms get your body. You know, I, I am just amazed at how much we are in alignment. I don't see, I don't see a division between academic freedom and um, anti-racism. I don't know how you divide them, especially when you're talking about black and or indigenous people. Our history is who we are. 
And if you're going to talk about academic freedom, you have to incorporate that history within your teaching. You have a responsibility. You can't just say, for example, let's take you know, the, the, the elephant in the room. Let's say the N-word that everybody's talking about these days. The N-word for me is not the big issue. It is what lies behind the N-word. What, uh, you know, when the boats, when the ships got to the continent of Africa and put our forebears on those ships, we went on as members of clans or members of tribes. We knew that. When we disembarked, we disembarked as something called Africans which means that people's identities were stripped during the, from the minute they entered that ship. They got off as Africans. That has a profound meaning to Black people because for those of us who were born outside the continent, we lost that attachment and those roots to the mate, to our mother country, not just for, and to our tribe, not just to the continent, but we lost the continuity. So if you are going to tea, and then of course, we went to the United States and people became slaves and then eventually they became blacks and coloreds and now up to now, you know, we're whatever we are. And we we're talking about Black Lives Matter. When we're teaching, what we have to remember is that Black lives have always mattered. And that our forebears, when they were teaching us and telling us stories, even if they were not born on the continent, like my forebears who come from Barbados, they were teaching me that in spite of that history, my life matters. And so when we're teaching it, we should not be concentrating on the word, but we need to know the history. We need to teach it. We need so that when we do use the word, the students understand from whence it came and the pain embodied in it and the history embodied in it. We have a responsibility to teach the true history in order to really look at that. There is no academic freedom in that sense. It's academic responsibility. That's my perspective. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. You said it eloquently that the uh, I think the, 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 the concern is the motivation and the intention behind certain kinds of words. My mama can call me anything she wants. I know she loves me. Exactly. Martin Luther King Jr. could call me in. That's all right. He died for me. Exactly. Malcolm could call me anything. Fanny Lou could call me anything. Rabbi Heschel, he could call me the N word. He was willing mm -hmm. to die. John Brown, Vanilla Brother, he died for black people. So it's what's, what's behind the words. Now, the problem, of course, is you've got ugly, debasing, degrading motivation so that the word reflects that. Yes. And uh, but I think part of the challenge, though, it is true that in the name of anti-racism, one can end up policing other people's language mm -hmm. because you see, you can't on the one hand say, white supremacy cuts so deeply in, let's say, the history of the American empire, which I think is true, and then be surprised when somebody uses a racist word. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, that's the history. That's the culture. Mm -hmm. so, you, so that you don't police people, you render them accountable and answerable and exactly. tell them stories and analysis as to why they are ending up using this kind of language with these perceptions of the world. Precisely. It also means that they have to unlearn, those who are using it, have to unlearn the myth that they have created about us. Absolutely. Because th those are not stories. We, we say, well, the stories you have, but those are not our stories. Those are myths. That's and right. we're continuing the myth. And, here's a, and the thing is, we have to always taught that myth, even you and me. Because we were taught in a Eurocentric manner. Absolutely. And so we teach the men. And not only do we teach it, but then we judge children on it. And from the time they enter school, we tell them the myth and we expect them to regurgitate the myth in the responses they give to our quizzes. And, and as they go through, go through high school, into university, postgraduate work, 
we continue that myth. We have to deconstruct that myth. Not only do we have to deconstruct it, but we have to dismantle it. And then together, we have to co-construct, if you will, a new history that belongs to all of us. And, 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 and so when we say things like we're going to ban, uh, we're going to ban Uncle Tom's cabin, or we're going to ban To Kill a Mockingbird, it means that we don't even understand the history of the authors who wrote that because they were both anti-racist. They, they were using those words to illustrate the pain of those words to, to, to the black, to black people. They were actually being supporters. They were being our supporters. They were helping us. So when you ban the word, you ban things that are part of us. And once you start banning words, you end up banning books. And that to me is totally unacceptable. So again, we are in agreement as far as I have been able to observe. Absolutely. I mean, I think part of the challenge is, is that academic freedom really is a way of acknowledging the unleashing of Socratic energy. Yes. The yes. need for serious questioning, the need for serious scrutinizing and interrogating. And it cuts a number of different ways, though. See, this is people want to control it and police it. And, and you really, really can't because... You see, on the one hand, you know, my books are being banned right now. Mm -hmm. Critical race theory is being banned mm -hmm. right now. I wrote the foreword to the book. They banned race matters and they haven't got the democracy matters right yet because they haven't understood the critique of imperialism. But they, they, they don't understand race, what race, you're race. trying to say. Exactly. They don't see class. They don't see gender. They don't see empires as clearly as they see race in regard to me. Yes. Yes. So that's what oh, he's only talking about black people anyway. He's just black man concerned about black people. Well, I love black people, yes, but I look through the lens of the black experience and I can conceive of what modernity is from, from below, from the plantation, in front of the lynching tree, in the hood, in the ghetto. I can understand nation states and markets and civic societies and, 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 and so forth from my own vantage point. You see. And well, so, that has yeah. to do with who we assume has knowledge and how we... Yeah, that's true. That's how exactly we determine right. who and who... And who controls knowledge? You know, not only who has it, but who controls it. And well, we at least they think they control it. Yeah, I don't think they really do, but they got a lot of power. And but that, exactly. But they don't control. They don't control it in my house. They don't control it in my neighborhood. We're just not on TV as much as they are. So that they think they control it. But in the end, there's always more excess overflow that they can never subsume, they can never fully control. They and can never they're, fully they're control. in life I mean? the problem because it, it, the word there is control. Yes, if yes, I yes. can't control it, how do I understand it? And if I don't understand it, then I just discard it and say, yeah, it's no bad. Yeah, yeah. And we can't, and, but my lens, your lens is as important as anyone else's. I do not expect to That's see right. life through the eyes of a Chinese person. I have Chinese relatives, but I can't see life through their eyes. I don't know what their full everyday reality is, but we have to give credence to it. We have to believe that they know their lives better than you do, better than I do. And that's where we run into the difficulty because we have created a system where power has been become or think some think it has become the purview as yes. of one group and so if you look at it you know i tell my students if you look at it as though you own you you've been taught all your life from the day you 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 were in your mom's tummy before you came out that you control all the resources in the world however you de determine resources whether it's the resources of literature of, uh, of, of minerals, whatever it is, of knowledge. And one day there's an awakening and those resources all rise up and say, you don't control me. 
No, mm-hmm. you do not. You have to that's work right. with me, but you don't control me. And that's very frightening for a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Because they don't know what to do. They've, they've always lived with this myth. The myth of ownership. And now those resources are saying, no, not only is it not true now, but it never was. Absolutely. It never Absolutely. was. Yeah. And that's one reason why um, humility, mm-hmm. intellectual humility, is so very important. But it's the intellectual humility that has to be inseparable from a moral and political and spiritual tenacity. You still have to know how to fight and engage in quest and pursuit Mm -hmm. truth, good, beauty, and holy. But you recognize you'll never have a monopoly on truth, so you better stop, listen, learn how to receive, not just give, and then be vulnerable enough. You see, this is part of the problem. You see, when you start talking about humility and vulnerability, then you're talking about existential issues in terms of how your self has been shaped, what kind of soul craft has gone into the making of who you are in your family, community, in relation to your tradition and heritage. Mm-hmm. And if, if you have no humility, then you're going to think whatever you see is real. You know, exactly. there's a wonderful letter that the great uh, Henry James wrote to the less great Robert Louis Stevenson in 1901. He says, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. Exactly. No theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. Mm-hmm. And so that split in your eye is the magnifying glass. That's what Adorno says. Absolutely right. So that, but how do you still attempt to see, feel, act in the world? Because we're human beings and all of us have certain lens. All of us have certain feelings. All of us have certain disposition to act, you see. And then what kind of moral and spiritual orientations are shaping what we see? the depths of what we feel, what compassion concerns we really have, and then what kind of courage do we have? Because a lot of folks see a whole lot and they still coward. They still if scared. we don't do that, but if you see, if we don't do what you just said, yeah. if, we, if, if we don't follow what James said, we run into what Du Bois talks about. But mm. Du Bois talks about us having those the, the double, the two identities, now he only did two, obviously, today, you know, with intersectionality, there's so many other right. faces that we, that we have to, to t- take into consideration. But he talked about Black people having to wear those two faces, those two identities, the identity of being a Black person and the identity of being a citizen of wherever you find yourself. So what does it mean? And this this has to do with Canada also. So what does it mean to me as a Black woman being a Canadian? What, 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 is, what are the rights surrounding that? What are the things that are expected of me? What are the things that I am allowed to do freely? And also, on the other hand, what does it mean to me as a Black person. And yes, there's a difference between Canada and the United States. We talked about it at the beginning, on, but only on one level. But when it comes to blackness, there is no border. That border is quite permeable. So I cannot look at what happened to George Floyd, for example, and say, I'm not going to look at that duality of which the boys spoke. George Floyd was my brother and in another way may actually have been a blood relation. But I don't know that because that ship that people were put on that took away the tribal and clan mm-hmm. and clan ship and turned them into something called Africans and then continue. I don't know if he's related to me. So I can't just say, well, I'm Canadian and he's American. So it has nothing to do with me. And that's the kind of thing that du Bois, to which Du Bois draws our attention and the thing of which James spoke. And it's mm. the things of which Baldwin spoke. Baldwin said, oh, yeah. you know, to be, I, I can't ignore James Baldwin, even though he's an American. Absolutely. He's a black man. He's my brother, you know. Lord, and he absolutely. spoke to me 
and about me. He Absolutely. says to be born black is to be born bloody angry. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, part of the problem of all the identity talk in the last 20, 30 years is that uh, it, it doesn't have enough context. It doesn't have enough complexity and nuance. All of us have multiple identities. Cool. And the question becomes, what do you mean by identity? Well, identity is, for me, you know, the desires for protection, recognition, and association in the face of death. Every human being, with, every animal with language has that. Uh, maybe a whole host of the animals that have less language. I haven't talked recently with the, with the, uh, with, with, with the, uh, um, uh, the elephants and things, but I know they remember and they bury their dead, so they mm -hmm. some serious mm -hmm. mammals, right? But the thing is, is that... Uh, uh, when you, when, anytime we talk about human identity, the crucial question is, what is the moral content of it, and what are the political consequences of it? See, Clarence Thomas is a beautiful black man. I would defend him against the police beating him up, yes. but he's not my political comrade. Exactly. He sides with, he sides with the strong and the wealthy and the mm -hmm. powerful. You see, and I have a very different orientation than he's a right wing brother. I'm not. He's beautifully black. I'm trying to be black and be beautiful too. But the point is, is that once we get into a dialogue about identity, if it only ends with just the skin pigmentation and not enough about the ethical cultivation and the spiritual formation mm -hmm. and the moral courageous action, see, that's where the real human dimension comes in. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and here in, in Canada, we are faced with a, a different thing also. also. If you mm. take that, that, you know, the egregious N-word, for example. Right. In, in Quebec, we've got French and English. There are some people who will argue that the word negre in, in French, which we, in the, as English speakers, see as the equivalent of the N-word, they would argue, oh, no, doesn't mean the same thing. It means Negro. It just means Black. But it's never used as an innocent. It's always, I work as hard as a neg. Or, or the minute you say that, the minute you say that, you have relegated this group to be less than. Mm. So you don't mm. get to say, well, it's not as egregious as the N-word because the intent behind it is the same. It's one of dominance and subjugation. And the minute you say that one group is dominant to another and, and the other is subjugated, then it doesn't matter. You can say the word tree or or mango or maple leaf. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't care what the word is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, the thing, and, and when you're talking about academic freedom, you have to incorporate that history, that knowledge, that understanding, that th those egregious and also the beautiful things, but you've got to incorporate it into your language. So if you look at, you know, we, and it's not limited to English literature. It's not limited to Harriet Beecher Stowe and stuff like that. Let's look at, um, for example, let's look at Kant, Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. We teach Immanuel Kant. We teach the liberal arts. We teach it, you know, we teach it in the classics. And sometimes we make reference to it in psychology because, I mean, the base of psychology is philosophy. So we, we teach about Kant. But if we don't tell the truth about Kant and we make it that Kant just talk about, you know, about critical thinking and he, he just talk about the imperial aesthetic and, and that kind of, And we don't say, but Kant was a horrible human being when it came to black people. When, it, you know, when, when, he, when he said that we... We, we weren't expected to understand things. We, 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 were, we weren't on the same level as white people. So you can teach anti-racism in any subject. Right now, we know that a lot of learned societies 
are going around having to apologize for the way they treated black and indigenous people and the science for the things you talk about black people say, for example, we didn't feel pain. And so you don't, you, it, there are inseparable academic freedom and anti-racism, they go hand in hand. If you're going to teach, teach the truth. But it, it's incumbent then upon the professor, upon the teacher, to do his or her homework. Absolutely. To learn. And then when you teach, say, yes, Kant gave us all of this. But he also did this. It, that's, that's the thing. No, this, this is where the self-righteousness has to be pushed back. Mm -hmm. and recognition of the complexity in a figure like Kant. You know, this mm. great essay, what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is the release from self-imposed immaturity. Dare yes. to know. He's invoking Horace. Now, on the one hand, a Kantian anti-racist would follow that and be critical of Kant's white supremacist remarks yes. and his observations. Yes. So that you can see the ways in which Kant has his own complexities. Yes. Now, White supremacists are going to take his white supremacist language, the same, they, same thing they would do with David Hume. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most powerful person mind in the English language is David mm -hmm. Hume, that Scottish brother, right? Mm -hmm. But he's got ugly racist formulations as well. Yes, he does. Energy. But he's also got a lot of Socratic energy. So you yes. use that energy to bring a critique to bear on his racism, and you're going to know a Humean and an anti racist, but acknowledging, as you rightly say, in his own writings, he fell down that white supremacist pit. Yes, but my yes. challenge is this, though. You tell me what you think about this. Because, you see, I believe that, uh, you know, we're living really in the, in, the, in, in the decaying moments of the American empire. And the most powerful ideology of modernity, and by modernity I mean 1492 to 1945, that historical mm -hmm, moment in mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. European empires tried to reshape the world within their image and interest. And mm -hmm. they've got some breakthroughs and they've got a whole lot of crime. So we've got to make a distinction between European crimes and European critical figures who themselves were critical of those crimes, right? Yes. But nationalism is so powerful. See, if people had to make a choice between gender and nationalism, race and nationalism, class and nationalism, they choose nationalism. They to choose this nationalism. day, to yes. this day, I was just blessed to write the uh, new introduction to France Fanon's Retreat of the Earth. This mm -hmm. is the uh, 61st six, anniversary. And, uh, you know, and he makes a distinction. You remember that essay on pitfalls of national consciousness between nationalism and national consciousness. Mm -hmm. Nationalism needs to be so very seriously interrogated because even when you push the imperialists out, you got another national bourgeoisie that will dominate its own people in the name of the nation and the flag with its patriarchy, with its class uh, uh, conflicts and class domination. And we haven't mm -hmm. got to but talked about the treatment of the indigenous peoples who were there, let alone the gay brothers and lesbian sisters and trans and non-binary folk who are mm -hmm. always culturally ma marginalized and often debased, you see. So the national consciousness is here to stay. Because self-determination and democracy comes into the modern world in the nutshell of the nation state. But mm -hmm. the nation state shot through with violence, with its monopoly on instrumentality of violence, shot through with its institution of public administration, has to be criticized from an international point of view. And Fanon called that the new humanism. We know mm -hmm. Sister Winters, Sylvia mm -hmm. Winters, coming out of Jamaica. New humanism. Martin King, what did he call it? The World House. Yes, the yes. The World House. The World Dark House. Culture, just called the Love Supreme and kept blowing. How do you sustain that global consciousness in a local context in which nationalism remains the most powerful ideology that can convince people to live and die for? So but that's, that, that's die for Canada. They'll die for America. They'll die for Barbados. They'll yes. die for Uganda, you see. You say, well, 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 are there some other things worth dying for? Dying for? Exactly. Die for the truth. Die for justice. Die but for in order freedom. to die for the truth, you have to first question nationalism. That's and nationalism true. has such a hold Absolutely. on the mind that Absolutely. people think,
people think that dying for the nation state is the end all and be all, that they have performed some kind of higher calling that they're, and when you put the state above you, you are willing to lie, to cheat, you are yes. willing to condemn yourself, your family, your 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 brothers and sisters, uh, wider brothers and sisters, and you're willing to bend them, bend them to this idea of the nurture. We saw this in, in Germany, in, in for example. We That's see right. this in other. We see this in other states. Die. I mean, we saw even saw some of it among the Spartans, for God's sake. You know, people could keep talking about the Spartans. We saw it in Rome. You know, the, the state was more important than the individual. Now, it's true that the, in the state is made up of individuals, but at some point, at some point, each member of society has to take a moral and ethical stance and say, That's right. Absolutely. This is not acceptable. This Even is if the state true. says this is so that's it. That's you got it. to say no. We had this battle with Brother Obama. Yes. But Obama yes. one, you got all these black folk waving the flag, all of a sudden you would think that they got injected with a patri patriotic peel or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you say to yourself, okay, of course I voted for Obama, I supported him, but as a critic. If it's just going to be a black face on an American empire that's still dropping drones on precious children in Libya and in Pakistan, if it's still going to be a black face in the White House, a White House built by slaves, black, people, black slaves, right? Yeah. Black face who's siding with Wall Street already yeah. shot through with corporate greed rather than homeowners or a surveillance state extended, whistleblowers crushed, that all this blackness is now subordinate to the nation state. And you got very few voices that were taking a stand against Obama because he's using blackness as a way of cheating us of seeing. All he uh, had to do was in his beautiful black face, and we didn't see the seven wars going on. We didn't see the drones drop. We didn't see Wall Street getting away with murder, you see. And for black folk, and you know, during that time, you know, I'm cutting against the grain because I'm a Christian, so I'll put every flag under the cross. Mm -hmm. Every flag under the cross. And that cross stands for unarmed truth and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak and unapologetic love, which is loving everybody beginning with the least of these. That's Martin Luther King Jr.'s tradition. That's my tradition. Is I'm going down to fight with that tradition. But one of the problems with the whole Obama thing is, yeah. and, and, and with all due respect, is, and, and it has to do with your country, is that your country. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth, my sister. But tell your country truth. is the ultimate national state. I, I know. Everything is for the flag. Everything yeah. is for the United in States. In an adolescent mode. In an adolescent exactly. mode. Exactly. To, to the extent where your country has trained its young to denigrate every other country on the face of the earth and even in your football games and your netball and your basketball games everything and, and and the others and there's another side which is that for black people all over the world when we saw obama a black man finally in the house of that slaves built our hearts were so filled that we were afraid to mm -hmm. criticize because that criticism, because his glory came down on us. It shone on us. We basked vicariously in that glory. And so to criticize him, which we would have done and which we did do with George Bush and all the others, to criticize them meant we were criticizing ourselves and that we were negating the progress that had come about. And so back to the two faces of the voice. Yes, yes, yes. And there's nothing wrong with self-criticism if exactly. you're looking to eyes that are blinding, especially blind to the suffering of the victims of the drones. 
the victims of Wall Street greed, because it's not about us. It's about the suffering. That's the suffering it. is the starting point. The suffering is the very orientation that allows us to theorize, intellectualize, and so forth, you see. And, and so that's you, why we have to teach the truth. That's, that's exactly why right. we have an academic responsibility. That's, and it's true for every group. If you are Ugandan and you can't engage in a powerful critique of the, the Ugandan national bourgeoisie that's not treating poor people right, we don't, right? we don't know of a national bourgeoisie that has not neglected, if not betrayed, poor and working people. But that's, I don't that, well, that's nationalism. What, whatever state you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. nationalism at its core. That's what it does. I mean, here in Canada, for example, we like to say that we are so much different to the United States. And we've already, we, you and I, we've just talked about the permeability of the border and that, you know, if right. you're black, we don't care where you are. We know we have a, a, a certain similarity in terms of the things that we've all endured. Now, here, right. in, here in Canada, for example, we forget, we forget that black people, we, we like to think of Canada being the synonym for Canaan, which we all know it was, uh, you know, Canada, when they, you know, we're going north, they're going to Canada, they're going to Canaan, they're going to Canada. We all know what that meant. Right, right. But what we don't talk about in Canada is that that reception has not always been great once they got here. And so a lot of the enslaved, at the end of the Underground Railway, at the end of the war, of the Civil War, obviously a lot stayed, but some went back. Now, some went back because their families were there. They wanted to fight. Fair enough. But some went back because of the treatment they had to endure here. Mm. If we look mm. also at the loyalists who came here to Canada, the loyalists came here from the United States you know, at the, the Revolutionary War, they came here, they were promised land, so much acreage. Some of them got the acreage, but then the government repatriated that land and gave it to the Acadians in, 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 in the Maritimes. Canada had laws which made it difficult for people to immigrate here. And what they ended up doing was they take the cream off those sending countries which really you know intellectually and also by definition economically impoverished those nations from which those persons were taken because they only mm. wanted the la creme de la creme they wanted the intellectuals they, you know you, they got these right. these points for it we had people the chinese people who helped build the railway but then had a tax imposed on them because in what I'm here anymore, there's still a lot of uh, there's still a lot of Canadians who think of Canada as a white country, and so one is constantly not only having to remind them, but having to in, try to insert oneself and almost make like to be welcome. Now, my 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 thesis is. If you're going to keep welcoming me into your house, it's still your bloody house. You know, it's your house. You're setting the rules for the house. You're telling me how I must behave in your house and to which room I can enter. You, it's your house if you're inviting me into your house. I don't want to be invited into your house anymore. What I want is to help you to destroy, to dismantle that house. And you and me together build a new house. We co-construct this house where we're all equal in it, where I have as much rights and say in that house as you do or as anyone that's, else do. But that's, I, that's, that's what Brother Martin meant by the world house. When that's we what, started, that's exactly when we started that's what this whole about. event with our dear sister being Victoria with the beautiful words of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters. Now, you see, they'd never been invited to the house because the genocidal attack and the effect of the disease and so forth meant that it was the violation of their precious babies and mothers and fathers. Exactly. That was the precondition of the building of the settler colonial house. Precisely. Then the, then the settler colonial house, which is an expansion of British empires and European empires, the French. European, empire. not just British, all of them. Uh, exactly. Exactly. 
And again, you know, the French and the British, you know, they got Diderot. I mean, you got you got the uh, William Morris. I mean, these are some serious human beings. Percy mm -hmm. Shelley ain't no joke. He's a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. He's my comrade. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Why? Because he chooses to be as a Brit who gets kicked out of Oxford. So he chooses to be. So it's the choices people make in terms of what the boys would call integrity in the face of oppression, honesty yes. in the face of deception, decency in the face of insult, and courage in the face of brute force. The boys mm -hmm. say those are the four questions for every human being, especially for oppressed people. And then the question becomes, how are you going to hold on to integrity, honesty, decency, and courage? Well, you do moment. what Cabral said. Cabral said, the stars. Yeah. Cabral said, stop shooting the bandit shadow and shoot the bandit. Ooh, Lord, so you teaching me, you teaching me. I, I don't even remember that in Cabral. Yeah, Cabral, yeah, Cabral Ooh, said, we said wait. all our time, shooting the bandit shadow and mm. shooting the bandit. Not getting to the core of it. And that's the core of it. And that's and that means, and, and, and again, it means dismantling. Otherwise, we're going to keep shooting the shadow. You can't hit the shadow. And this mm -hmm. is true in Canada, in the United States, in Britain, in the Caribbean. You look at, you know, I don't know if you know. Fred Hinklin's. Fred Hinklin talked a lot about this. God rest his soul. He's passed on now. But Fred talked about colonialism and its impact upon the souls and minds Absolutely. of Caribbean people. Absolutely. And, you know, imagine, I, 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 you know, if you read George Lamy, imagine you live in a hot country, a hot, hot country. And you are wearing a worsted wool suit to work mm. because that is what is expected of you. Imagine being a black little girl growing up in Barbados, a little black girl. And what were the songs I was singing? The Maple Leaf Forever and singing things about Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. And of course, that Britain didn't read referred to me as so many people who went up to England with the wind rush and now are being displaced and told, you don't, you're not British, you don't have a passport, when they were told, you didn't need one to come here and work. And now they're, what they put into the building of Britain is being, is being de denied and they're being sent back to countries which they don't even know, those children. They don't even know because they thought they were Britons. But we grew up singing Britons Never Never Shall Be Slaves and the Maple Leaf Forever. I didn't even know what a Maple Leaf was. I was from Barbados, for God's sake. What is Maple Leaf? What is that? And, you know, I came on, somebody gave me maple sugar, maple syrup, and I thought, I don't like this. I, I, I didn't know what it was. But that is the brainwashing that was done to us. And we kept chasing that shadow. We didn't see the bandit, and our own teachers taught us that. Not oh, yeah. just the teachers who came from England, teachers, but our own teachers. Our own they wore, yes, they wore worsted suits to work in that hot sun. But you know, I think the one danger, though, and you tell me what you think about this, and using that word dismantle, is that a lot of our young brothers and sisters of all colors in colleges and universities sometimes understand that as just trashing everything in the West. Yeah. As if Western civilization is hom hom homogeneous and monolithic. That is not. Yeah. See, Mary Shelley is not Queen Victoria. Exactly. See, that, 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 that there's multiplicity within British civilization. You get this even in Gandhi's great uh, Hindus Swaraj of 1909, right, when he writes in South Africa. And mm -hmm. he, he got this trashing of Western civilization. His best friend. Is calling back. There you go. Dictating the book to a Jewish brother from Lithuania. Mm -hmm. He got Sonia running his organization. She's a Jewish sister from Moscow. He's mm -hmm. got Ruskin. He's got Tolstoy. He's got all of these voices from the West. And yet people are hearing it. 
Gandhi's believe we got to trash the West. You trash the Western crimes. That's you trash it. The Western structures of domination. Yes. He went after the behold, bandit. There's some other Western folk who thought about that too. You're not exactly. the only one. You're not That's the only right. one. But you can still go beyond Tolstoy in terms of your Indian perspective. You can go beyond Ruskin. But you learn. And we got to teach our young people when we dismantle the way, let's say, Audre Lorde talks about it, right? With the That's right. Talk. You're building on the best of what came before whatever civilization exactly. you're talking about. Indigenous exactly. peoples, European, uh, African, whatever it is. Because we human beings, we got to work with what we got. It's bad enough. got to work with what's there. there. Yeah. If, yeah, I mean, you, if, you, if we're going to cut off various, various parts of our arm in the name of identity, we can't even deal with this ecological catastrophe. We can't exactly. deal with this corporate greed. We can't deal with patriarchy running out of control and so forth and so on. So, so, so the issue becomes, how do we mobilize all that we can with Du Bois's criteria? Integrity, yeah. honesty, decency, courage. Exactly. Exactly. We have to start. We have to learn how to shoot the bandit, not the shadow. Yes, and we, like have to, we have to learn to take out those bits that are good. As I said, not teaching Uncle Tom Scavin denies the fact of Harriet Beecher Stowe's humanity. That's and it true. denies the fact that that man, Josiah Haynes, came to Canada and that she based her story on this wonderful black, this wonderful black man. It, it, killing, it yes. kills to, to a mockingbird, denies. That's right. Denies Harper Lee's fight against racism. She wrote that after the, the, the bus boycotts of Birmingham. And so she used the language she used, that uses to illustrate a point to say, people, these are the things with which we are faced as a society. And as a society, we have to fight them. I noticed that Dr. Sana wants to open the the door to Ooh, brother Dr. Jude, brother yes. Dr. Jude. Yeah, we're ready. We're yeah. ready, Jude. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we can keep this going, Cornell. Oh, should we go I, on I, for I, we can go on for hours? I'll show yeah, get me We're gonna have yeah. to keep we're just gonna have keep to keep in touch and keep this going. Absolutely, though. It's just a blessing to be and in company. I know, I know you can continue the hours. Um, <laughs> um, but we have a lot of we have a lot of questions. I will ask the first question, and uh, the person who had to to know the view of of Doctor West on this. Um, I do understand you seem not to see a tension between academic freedom and anti racism, but it, it, it but is it not true that the academic freedom, as we know it today in our Western universities, is essentially a privileged production? an articulation of the privileged group who produced this to call academic freedom, a group of people that were absolutely not inclusive culturally and racially, at least, mm -hmm. mainly male, Christian, and white. This is a, a great question, Dr. West. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Let me just see where I would begin on this, though, because... Um See, I don't begin with the notion that people in power have full control or people in power are to be at the center of the discourse. You see, as a black man, I don't begin my life with the white normative gaze. The white brothers and sisters are on a human continuum like everybody else, but I got my own gaze. That's like a jazz musician. Louis Armstrong don't care about the white brother blowing the trumpet on the other side of town. He just listens to it and try to learn from it and keep blowing because he's blown coming out of his own tradition. You see, it's, it's, you know what I mean? Sarah Vaughn ain't worried about Maria Callas singing beautifully. She's learning from Maria Callas, but she's coming out of her own tradition with her own voices, her own nuances, her own self-confidence, her own sonic confidence. Well, see, I'm a jazz man. I'm a blues man. So I don't, so that when we talk about the white men and so forth, these are just brothers of, of a certain uh, pigmentation like any other brothers and they have certain privileges, they have certain power, but they don't have all power and the privileges that they have are contingent. They can be called into question 
immediately. Massive rebellions, massive social movements, push society elites overnight, believe me. They push society elites overnight. And so I'm never really awed or never really start with the analysis of uh, something like academic freedom. Academic freedom is a particular manifestation of voices that are raised under certain conditions. The university has its own history. And of course, that history is shot through with white supremacy. How could it not? It's shot through with male supremacy. How could it not? It's shot through with its alliances with national elites. Every university is tied to the hegemonic ideologies of the nation. You, you let Canada go to war, you let America go to war, and you see how quick academic freedom collapses for those who are critical of the war. They'll send them to jail, demonize them in a second. Ivy League schools pushed them all out during World War I and II. So much for objectivity and academic freedom when it came to national state identity. And in the name of nationalism, there's been some vicious repressions of, of, uh, of voices. Well, you see, I defend those voices. I defend those voices, whether they're right or whether they're wrong. People have a right to be wrong. That's what a dialogue is all about. That's what a democratic space is all about. But it is rarely the case that nation states, it's rarely the case that even universities are true to the kind of freedom I'm talking about, of raising voices. Um, so that's the beginning of an answer. I know I don't want to take too much too much time on that, but that's the beginning of an answer. There. And, and maybe I can ask the second question. Have your both views on on on, on it? Um, the question is: um, I want to know uh, what your thoughts are about equity and diversity hiring and acceptance policies in the in 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 the university today in relation to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr some argue that uh, instead of encouraging a colorblind society as King did since these policies choose some people and exclude and exclude others on the basis of, of, of the color of, of the skin, it contributes to a society that puts skin color over the, the unique individual and their particular accomplishments. What are your thoughts on, on, on the issue? Uh, Martin Luther King, he did not, I, 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 as I, I mean, what I understood from Martin Luther King from listening to him and reading his work, he never said that. Um, he favored blackness over whiteness. He said he favored people working together. He talked about the character of people more than he talked about this. Because if you look at his I Have a Dream speech, he said, uh, one day I want to see the, the sons of slave owners and the sons of, of slaves coming together as one. So, uh, the, the, and the other thing about, you know, equity, it's all nice and fine to talk about equity, but if you're not careful, equity can end up like a, a piece of polka dot cloth where you've got all these dots and maybe they're of the same size on it. But if there's no inclusion, if there is no way, if you don't, if there's no cohesion, no way for people to feel that they have equal status and uh, equal words and that their words are given equal weight and their opinions are solicited and that they help to build that structure and that building is respected. You don't have much. And that's one of the problems is that people that equate often diversity with equity and equity with inclusion. There are three parts of one concept but they, you need all three parts to be working together, as far as I'm concerned, to Absolutely. say, okay, thank you, to say that you've really got it. So I don't see, again, in terms of academic freedom, it needs, you need the responsibility. And part of that is your responsibility is understanding that understanding the history and apply it. I know I'm repetitive, but it's what... I no, mean. but you're speaking the truth. I mean, the very notion that you associate diversity with lower quality is part yeah. of the problem. 
It's part of the problem. It's part of the problem. See, in Martin King, you know, when you think of Martin King, though, you should think of someone who is first and foremost a Christian minister who's called to preach the gospel. So he's following a Palestinian Jew named Jesus. Jesus never told people to be colorblind. He told them to be love struck. That's it. Now, what does love struck mean? Love struck means through empathy and imagination, you conceive of what it's like to be in the shoes of someone else and you identify with their needs. And for you, they, those needs are sacred. That's what 25th chapter of Matthew is all about. What you've done to the poor, what you've done to the prisoner, what you've done to those who have been done unto me. Done unto me. Yeah. No talk about dogma, no talk about doctrine. It's what you did being love struck. When Martin Luther King comes along as a black man, a New World African, and decides to be a follower of Jesus, like myself, it is when we encounter other human beings, we ought to be love struck, not in the Hollywood sense of sentimentality, but of the sense of being connected to their humanity and a steadfast commitment to their welfare. You see, that's the hesed. That's the genius of Hebrew scripture. That's the love that's what I to the orphan and widow and fatherless and motherless and persecuted and oppressed, you see. And, and so that's Martin's tradition. So when I see my right wing brother and sister say, oh, he wanted to be colorblind. We, 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 we have no concern about their context. We have no concern about what has shaped them. It's simply a way of mobilizing a colorblind discourse that hides and conceals the suffering. It's the very opposite of what Martin was talking exactly. about. Exactly. It's the opposite of what the, the, the Jesus that Martin was following was talking about, you see. And, and Martin, mm -hmm. and color blindness mm -hmm. is, is a silly thing. It doesn't even exist. It's, it's something that has cr been created to keep certain people oppressed because if you negate the humanity of them, if you negate their identity and you just do this thing where you watch them out, then you don't have to look at the suffering that is being caused to them that in which you may have played a part or may not, but you don't have to recognize it. You can just say it's not there. And true academic freedom, as far as I'm concerned, true academic freedom means also fighting the state, saying to the state, your textbooks aren't telling the truth. We are, right. we are trapped in this myth that you are supporting. We, are, we don't want to do that anymore. We will not do it anymore. We mm. will tell the truth. And that's the opposite of na the nationalism to which you spoke, because the nationalism said, here is the homogeneity. This is what we expect you to turn out. You know, all the eggs are white. You know, what's this brown egg doing in here? <laughs> you know, mm, I mean, mm, what's mm, that's mm. happening? And true academic freedom means standing up to the state and saying, these brown eggs, the place of these brown eggs is as important and has the same force, the same moral force as all the other eggs in the package. They're not anomalies. They belong. That's, they are included and they must be included. That's what you are. Professors, academic freedom, we have more power than we think we do. But the thing is, and, and I don't blame any of us for doing it. Um, the state nationalism says, you know, you got to have, you, you have to behave a certain way. You have to publish so much. You have to do this within the academy. And those who are judging us, this is almost like a little square. And don't you dare step outside that square or we will punish you by not paying you the same amount as, you know, we know that black professors don't get paid the same amount of United States. We know that. We, we won't give you the same privileges when it comes to, applying for grants. You don't get the grants the same way. And we assume that those of the dominant class can write about you, but when you write about yourself, we question whether what, your knowledge, what you know about yourself is true. We question the source of your knowledge, whereas we accept the source of someone else's knowledge about you. We accept, we're willing to go with the myth rather than going with the reality of your knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's what nationalism does to you. In academic freedom, we eschew that. 
Got to cut against the grain. But see, I'm not surprised, though, about what's going on in the United States because, you know, when you live in the days of an empire that is decaying, so you get not just polarization, you get gangsterization. Mm-hmm. Because, and gangsters are different than hypocrites, you see. Hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. Mm-hmm. So hypocrite has standards, they just know they're falling short. Gangster have no standards. They have no standards. Trump's just, Trump's a gangster, the brother's a gangster, dead up. I grew up with gangsters, I got gangsters inside of me. So that a gangster will say anything, do anything, and no accountability. It's like Papa Doc in Haiti. Mm. See what I mean? Just say anything, do anything. Hitler, gangster, capital G, say anything, do anything. No accountability whatsoever. Well, see, in America, we're, we're experiencing the gangsterization of our whole society. So what happens is you get distrust, despair about communicating and, 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 and engaging in conversation, then the paranoia, and then the poverty of imagination. And by poverty of imagination, we mean we don't even want to get into the skin of other people. Mm-hmm. We're not even concerned about what they're going through, their fears, anxieties, and insecurities. It's just about me. So it reinforces the narcissism. You get this in the professional managerial mode where the narcissism and careerism is running amok. You get it in the working classes. You get it on the ground. We saw it in the halftime of Super Bowl the other day. Yeah. The greatest musical tradition of the modern world, black musical tradition, can't say a mumbling word about the challenge of Brother Brian Flores to the NFL as a plantation system other than the vanilla brother who took a took a knee. Eminem. Mm-hmm. He was the only one that had the courage. Why? Because for them, just being black in hip hop was enough. Not truth telling, exactly. not witness bearing, not taking a risk, not courageous witness, just spectacle. But that's what that's what neoliberal late capital society is. It's just spectacle, pose and posture and act like you so bad and act like you so courageous. And when it's time to get tested, you're weak as pretty sweet and Kool-Aid. They didn't. And, and if you listen to the lyrics, I mean, I'm a big yes. Eminem fan. Big, yes. big Eminem fan from the time he came out. And if you listen to his lyrics, his lyrics lean more towards liberation than a lot of our black brothers who are doing rap. He's oh, not just talking about the no, money. About he, he, and, 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 He's and, talking and, about and, internal psyche. That's right. And his anthem about, and so you know, take, you may not get this opportunity again. Stand up. You have to stand up and speak up. He's the only Billions of people. Lyrics. You got a Tommy Smith, John Carlos moment of billions of people around the world. Yes. And he's the one who took the knee. When the he's NFL the one who had said to, him, to do it. They Absolutely. told him not to do it. They told him he better not do it. They said, you better not do this. And he said, I got right. news for you. And he not only took the knee, but he stayed down there for yeah, long right. enough he in did. the pose of calling. He stayed down there. He stayed down because he wanted that message sent out. This is not just me. This is not a genuflection like you go to church and you just genuflect and that, get that. up. He stayed down there in a praying position and with his head down and his hand up, he sent the message. No one else did. Nobody else did. Nobody no, else yeah. did. So we That's get what courage saying, becomes so crucial. In That's right. In pigmentation. I'm going with John Brown and Eminem as a scared. I'm going with John Brown and Eminem. Black exactly. folk when they get on the platform because it's a exactly. human. Exactly. Exactly. It's a human witness. Absolutely. You know, he bore witness. The uh, You know, Jay-Z, talented man. Oh, he's a genius now. Dr. Genius. Dre. It's, Jay-Z Talented. is scared. Jay-Z is scared. He doesn't want exactly. to go against the brain of his elite. He's a scared genius. There's a whole lot of scared geniuses Same in the world. Same thing That's with Dre. Be honest about it. Keep on moving. Same thing with Dre. They don't want to give up their positions. Jay's first song was F the Police. Exactly. That's the and first song. And he doesn't song. sing that anymore. Dre doesn't sing Now when I'm anymore. playing the police on television, yeah. And he don't have that same no. And not only that, you know, it's the end that talking about 
I love the streets. I love the streets. The streets. Yes, you did. Say, well, no, no, no. You don't love the streets. You got to love the people on the streets. That's right. The people the street on the, the no streets feelings. can turn people into thugs and gangsters. The streets can turn people into saints and freedom fighters. You don't just love the streets. That is a vague act of trying to rationalize your street origins as you undergone upward mobility as a survivor as now a billionaire. This ain't yeah, but he's no longer a survivor. This is about the suffering on the streets, man. He's now Wall Street and they're not going to give up Wall Street because they've made it and they've become part of that elite. That's and good. just going and good. maybe making a contribution every year with your taxes, you know, as a foundation to, to get hide some money. That's not what he's about. Eminem took that knee and Eminem down. He was the great example of that moment. That's exactly. exactly. And that doesn't in any way call into question your artistic genius and talent. Of folks. No, I mean, Mary, Mary J is a queen. Mary J is a queen. She gave it all. Yes, she is. She's genius still a queen, I mean, but nobody she just didn't composes like Dre. And and the same thing for Jay. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You gotta give them their due. No, I'm with but this is what again to academic freedom, when you're teaching, you have to bring in all of that. You have to expose your student to these realities. Yeah. And then and then this whole business about why can't I use the N-word? Well the the for me, the thing about the N-word is that we've taken it back because it was never our word. We didn't create that word. And no. now, now we're saying you can't use it. And people are saying, well, why can't I? And what I'm hearing in this is you took something from me. This was mine. And you took it. You say, yeah, we took it. And we've got a phenomenon. And I know you've got it in the United States too, but we've got it here in Canada also. Where mm. the youngsters, the youngsters have created these cards. And the young, uh, you pay $25 for a card if you're from the dominant group and you want to use the N-word. And the youngsters are saying, you want to use the card? You want to use the word? You have to buy this card and show this card. Wow. Before, before that, you use the I've never heard of that before. Yeah, it's there. And you, you buy the card. And, it, and that sends home the point of, A, this is not your word anymore you can't just use it but also ask the question it forces you them to ask the question of why is this word so important to you mm. that you're willing to pay wow to use wow. this word I, I mean i think it's genius i'd also wow. the kids are making some money they show some entrepreneurship but but it's it's a very interesting phenomenon. That wow! Well, but but you, but you, you know the other reality is here, and I'm just thinking of. Can you imagine Nina Simone was up there at halftime? She gonna come with the truth. You see, Curtis Mayfield. Look what they did to but, her. But, but, if, if, but if everybody no longer used the N word in perpetuity, there would still be ways in which black people would hate themselves and disrespect exactly them and not affirm themselves. So. As much as I'm, I, I, I agree, I got the N-word single on my album. You know, we, we yeah. debate back and forth. But the sources of self degrade this is true for women as well, true for gay, any group that has been historically degraded, yep. you've got to come up with sources and resources that are outside the male gaze, outside of the white gaze. Not because every male is, is so thoroughly misogynistic, but because every male has been socialize into socialize to be exactly or every white has been socialized into a white supremacist world you see but yeah. to think that somehow just let's just have a moratorium on the n-word across the changes board. nothing it, it, it's gonna change a little bit but it ain't gonna change the whole lot but it's not but it's also not going to change in you internally if you have right. there you, you know, go it's That's just right. a bloody you take word your as own I said. responsibility and initiative yes. for that kind of thing. The the word for treat. Using the N-word, a illegal act. You go to jail to use the N-word in Cuba. Is yes. there racism in Cuba? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Blue, it gray, changes gray, nothing. Grass green, but the, the institutional capacity of racism exactly. is less in Cuba than it is in America and Canada. But you still got racism. We still Cuba. got racism. And the other thing about the N-word is that if you look at it from a linguistic perspective, 
People mm. create words as part of a history to help tell their history. Yes, 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 yes. And we, we didn't talk about that. You know, we, we talked about the N-word as this word of insult, this word of degradation. But we haven't talked about it, especially younger, younger people. Not only it's something that's theirs that you don't have access to, that we can use among ourselves. I mean, if you were to say to me right now, Sister, you know, Sister Myrna, you are my N-word. I know you're not insulting me. I know what you're telling me. That's I right. know, and That's you know true. what I'm going to say to you? I'm going to say to you, thank you, Brother Cornell, because you're my N. Absolutely. I'm down with that. That's I'm exactly. down with that. And, and what that would mean is, I take a bullet for Sister Myrna, she take a bullet for Brother Cornell. Exactly. You call me anything you want, my sister. Call me anything you want. That's, That's right. Good. So don't take away my language at that point. <laughs> for me to interact with you That's and right. send that message to you because you can't use that word anymore and it bothers you. That's the second constant. The third part of it is that words help to create history. And using that word for a lot of people is a way where they can create a new history. This mm. as part of who they are. This is this this indicates me. And that's a trajectory that we haven't explored. Nonetheless, it's there. I look at Kennedy's book, you know, Kennedy at uh, at Harvard when Oh wrote, Brother Randall, yeah. Yeah. Randall, Randall when yeah. Randall wrote the book, you know, and a lot of people are upset that he wrote the book. I am quite happy that he wrote the book. You know, I don't agree with a lot of things Randall's has said and done. But, right, I'm yes, not, so. but it's like Clarence Thomas. I'm glad he's there. I don't agree with, I agree with very little that he says or does. But I don't want to take away his achievements. I don't want to take away Randall's achievements. I don't, I'm not a big fan of James Werther. But, you know, but some of what James Werther, did, I understand. I, I, right, I, that's right. But I am that's glad that Randall wrote that Oh, oh perhaps he's got to lift his voice. He's got to lift his voice. Lift and the I, voice and be accountable. Be accountable. Exactly. Be accountable. He, he Take put responsibility. It up there. That's exactly. exactly right. No, he's my and very dear like this brother voice. who's right and wrong at the same time. He's right and wrong. Exactly. And I tell you, in that book, I learned a lot of stuff in yeah, that book. He's got a rich history in there. He's, he's got, got a lot of rich history in there. Do I agree with everything he says? Absolutely not. But well, that's why academic freedom is something that is so precious, not the way it's cast just in the academy, but from the vantage point of people who have a genuine love for folk who are catching hell. Yes, exactly. No where they are. But I begin on whatever the top else side you said about over Werther. to the other side. Yeah, whatever else you say about my worth and about Kennedy. They do care about people who scatch it out. Maybe they don't see it the, right. through, oh, through our true. eyes. That's right. That's they don't exactly. see it through our eyes. But they uh -huh. do care. I'm not going to take away from them and say they don't care. Now, their solutions are not solutions to which I adhere. That's right. Same here. Same here. That, but I will never say they don't care. Just like I won't say that Dre doesn't care, but his manifestation <laughs> of it. That's exactly right. It's no, not is, he's made a di difference in my life as a, as a musician. And as an That's artist. right. Oh, my God. Oh, you know, absolutely. the man is, yeah. I don't like a lot of things that Louis Armstrong stood for. But I put it within the context of when that man lived, the things to which he, were sub he was subjected. And I say, okay, but I am a big jazz fan, you know. As you say, I listen to a lot of blues. I look at how it, what it did to Nino Simone. I look at what happened to Ella Fitzgerald. I oh, even like Big yeah. Spider Man. You know what I mean? Oh and no, I, Bex can blow. That exactly. Ella brother can blow. But he, he said at the feet of Louis Armstrong because he knew where the great exemplars exactly. were. Exactly. Regardless of anything else come about out of Louis Horn, that European instrument that he's Africanizing, it is expressing the plight, the struggle, the suffering, not just of black people, but of every human being who makes the move from mama's womb to tomb. That's right. What's in his horn. That's, That's right. What and he knew music. what it makes you what it was to suffer. Absolutely. Birth, right. death, suffering, suffer. dread, disease, despair, joy, exactly. struggle, resilience.
All yeah. that's right there, just like it's in Beethoven's Ode to Joy, using that yeah. Schiller form. Mm -hmm. Ludwig is laying that thing out. Same as Charlie Parker, you know what I mean? That's right. The bird suffered. I do and uh, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> Dr. Owens and Dr. Lashley, I know <laughs> you can go for hours, <laughs> but I, I really like to, to, to take a, 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 another question because we have like uh, more than uh, 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 3,000 sure. que to, to Bring them on. questions. No, absolutely. Let it and flow. Let them, it flow. We're going with the yeah. spirit, but you know that. Yeah, one of them is very important. It is like... Uh, a lot of professors continue to use a, 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 a certain words yeah, um, at our universities, and and we have that question. Given the the, the history and the harm behind certain words, it elicits uh, a harm and gener gener generational trauma uh, when used, uh, regardless of the intent behind. So, in sense, uh, the word is um, engulfed uh, to a physical weapon that causes harm to, to, to the affected people. I want to, to hear you about this, uh, but try to be short because after this, I want to, to, to have to, to just uh, <laughs> a, a, a very last question because we, we, we just have one minute left. So, doc, Dr. West and after Dr. Lashley. Okay. Well, for me, it depends on which word, though, brother. He's talking about the N word. Uh, the, the, oh, you talking about the N word? Canada. The, the question word again? in Canada is, is oh, about no, no. the N word. They shouldn't use the N word in class, though. just a regular word. They don't need to use the N word. Just like you don't use bad words for women and others in class. If you're reading a novel and people are trying to bring to life various characters in various neighborhoods, then of course they're going to use the word. You got to be true to the language that people are using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And you have to make that distinction between this is what artists do. They lay bare and detect all the incongruities and contradictions of what it is to be human. And the language that people use can be offensive. Get a thicker skin. But if the professor's using the word, no, to see, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that because you start disrespecting folk in the class. You have to have a context of a classroom. Exactly. It's not so much safe in a superficial way. It's got to be respectful in a substantive way to everybody who's in that classroom. But I know my dear sister's got something to say. But I, well, I don't have any more to say because I agree with you. Um, mm. I am, I am not about to take an artist's words and change them, but I will contextualize them. Absolutely. And that's and that's why it came, comes back to me, to both of us saying, know the history. If you're that's going to teach these books, know from whence they came, how they came about, what the artist was trying to say. And then when you use the word, explain that this word is part of the zeitgeist at the time. And the word was used to send this message. I keep talking about Harper Lee and to, and to Kill a Mockingbird because every school child learns that in, 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 uh, in high school. But you make sure that they know that Harper Lee was actually someone who was fighting racism and she used the word to illustrate how people were being hurt and why it's necessary to fight racism. But, but the question is what universities can do when some professors continue to use the N-word um, saying it is our academic freedom to use whatever word we want. You mean rather than in the context of the book? Yes. Then that's when, not that's when you have professors who said, uh, who say we want to use the N-word if, if we want. And what universities, uh, we have that question, what we, universities can do? No, it's disrespectful. It's universities disrespectful. have context of respect. It's like hollering fire in a in a theater mm -hmm. that free speech is not some kind of unconditional thing it's always relative to some context and we're not going to put up with any kind of intentional degradation of any group no matter who they are indigenous folk women jews palestinians arab muslims black folk or whatever as a professor now if a professor can't situate him and herself in that context of respect you know, then you've got some serious accountability vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the administrators and the, the leaders of a university. And I don't believe in policing, but I believe in accountability. So do I. In the of respect now. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, if they're using the word gratuitously and say, it's my right to say whatever. No, it's right. not. No, it's not. No, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Academic freedom comes with academic responsibility. That's right. That's it right. It is not your right. You don't get to call me that and walk away. I mean, you, no, hell no. Mm-hmm. You know, you, yeah. no, no. That's, that's but if you're happen. using it in the book and reading the passage and say blah, 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 especially if you set it up so that the students understand that they're learning history as if it's in this book, it's not just right. a book for a book sake. Then, of, right. course, of course, you don't change the artist's word. You don't change Mozart's note because you don't that's like right. C sharp. You know what I mean? You don't change Miles' note because you don't like the way, come on. <laughs> a, a, last, a, a very last question to, to finish and I will also ask you to, to have uh, uh, closing words uh, af- um, first we, we want to hear from the, Dr. Lashley and then uh, Boro West um, the question is um, actually what universities can do to reconcile academic freedom and anti-racism in our universe, what they can do? Well, I think the first thing they have to uh, do is uh, accept that systemic racism exists and do what is necessary to change it. Uh, I think um, it goes before it gets to university. We have to start some serious truth telling. And we haven't done that. We have to start truth telling in the way we teach history, in the way we teach the histories of all people, that this is not black history or indigenous history. This is Canadian history. And universities have to look at the role they're playing. And unless they can start truth telling, they're always going to run up against this problem. Dr. West. No, oh, but that, that says it, that the university has to go back to its fundamental aim, its mission which is the quest for truth and knowledge and beauty. And there have been imperial conditions in place for the quest for truth. There's been patriarchal conditions in place for the quest for truth. There's been white supremacist conditions in place for the quest for truth. So the quest for truth oftentimes is so narrow truncated and blinding And we need to unleash the limits of our quest for to broaden, deepen our limits for the quest of truth, because we're aware more and more of just how deep the imperial conditions have been. Canada, Barbados, Uganda, South Mm -hmm. Africa, India, and so forth. Eastern Europe. Ottoman, Austrian, Hungarian empires, Russian empires, and so forth. Same is true for white supremacy. Exactly. Same is true for patriarchy. Same is true for homophobia. These are not just PC chit chat labels. These are institutional and personal realities, forces, tendencies in the world, and especially in the modern world, that has shaped who and what we are. And if we're not capable of coming to terms with that, then we lose the planet. Everything is at stake. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, Dr. Ashley. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. West. Um, and uh, I have also special thanks to Carl Spencer and, and uh, his team at the Faculty of Social Sciences, the communication team. I also have special, very, very special thanks to Dr. Victoria Baram, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, and uh, the Alex Trebek uh, uh, Forum for Dialogue. Um, we, we got a, a, a passionate discussion between Dr. West and Dr. Lashley. And what my conclusion will be is, um, if I understand well, uh, academic freedom is anti-racist. The true academic freedom is anti-racist. And the true academic freedom comes with academic responsibility. And we cannot see academic freedom without academic responsibility. So thank you to all of uh, all of our uh, all of the audience and uh, thank you for all your questions. And uh, I think we can create um, an anti-racist society. And to create it, we have to not forget together we are the solution. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you.